أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Thank you for tuning in to part four of my ancestor Bilali. And for this segment, we're going to talk about the Muslim sons of North America, inshallah, uh, the African origins of the Celts, and how to read your DNA analysis. So you may say, well, what does the Celts have to do with your ancestor, Bilali? Well, it has something to do with what I'm going to talk about before uh, we, we get to that part. So um, in the lessons of the teachers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it asks the question, how many original Muslims are there in North America? It also asks the question before that, how many Muslim sons are there in North America? So for some of you, some of you who are Muslim, there's like there's no distinguishing of colors and so forth and so on. But the question is, how many original Muslims are there in North America? And how many Muslim sons are there in North America? Now in the Quran, it talks about the theoryat of Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Our father Ibrahim, he has a theory at. And in fact, Allah says in the Quran that the name Muslim was given to you by your father Ibrahim. So the first Muslims were those who descended from Ibrahim. Now, everybody is not a descendant of Ibrahim. So, but those who descend from Ibrahim, these are the ones that were called Muslim. So when our lessons talk about Muslim sons, we're talking about those who are not from the original Muslims, but they accepted Islam. But not only did they accept Islam, they also are, are those who descend from the original Muslims. Now, in the South, uh, I, I spoke about in part one and part two how my family is like uh, an African clan that was basically invented or created here in America through genetic memory, through marrying within the same families, just like we do in Africa, even though uh, they took away our name, they took away our language, our religion, our culture, but they couldn't take away our soul. They couldn't take away that genetic memory that's in that operates on a cellular level. They couldn't take that away. So through that, we married people who were of our particular clan, our particular tribe, without even knowing it. Without our brain knowing it, but our soul knew. Our soul was attracted to this person. Our soul was attracted to that person. And through that, when I finally did my DNA, I noticed that every branch of my family was related. It was just unreal. It just blew my mind. Not only did I have double cousins, I have triple cousins, cousins that are related to me on three sides of my family. So in the South, uh, uh, you know, there was this practice um, you know, it was called the brown bag test. The brown bag test. And this was a test where people were checked that you couldn't be a part of this particular social group unless your skin was either as light as a brown paper bag or lighter than a brown paper bag. So when black people would choose their mates, this particular group of society, which was called the upper elite, you know, a black society, when they would choose their mate, they would choose their mate which, which, uh, that had certain features and certain characteristics. Whether they knew it or not, that in Africa is 
Fulani behavior. Fulani are known to be endogamous, meaning they only marry among their own. And in this particular group, and it's documented in a book called Our Kind of People, this book breeded a certain professional class. And they said they got this tradition from Africa. They didn't say which people in Africa per, in particular, but they said they, they, had, this, they had this particular um, practice of selective breeding and breeding a particular class of people since Africa. Now, they had lost their language, they had lost their knowledge, but they knew this was an old practice. And they bred certain doctors, they bred certain lawyers, they bred other type of professions. That is exactly Fulani society. In Fulani society, you have different classes of people. You have what is called the, the, the Ardo class or the, or the, or the, the, Hore, the Hore Bay, which is the, usually the scholars, the Cherno Bay. They're, they're scholars, they're, they're the teachers, they're the spiritual class. They are what you would call the clergy class. This is one class of people they marry into themselves. They're all Fulani, but this class only marry into that class. And the Amri Laj Muhammad talked about this too. It's called, what, he said, one of the things the white people took from us was the science of mating. And in Africa, this is how they mate. This is how they marry. Then you have a group called the Chums, who are the blacksmiths. These people, they know their iron works. They know how to, you know, they know how to make things. They know how to build things. This is a whole class of the Fulani. Then you have the, uh, I believe it's the Nyalawo or, the, or, the, or the, uh, the, the tailors, you know, and this is a class of people who know how to make clothes, they know how to tailor, they know cotton weaving, this is their science. Uh, you have a class of women who are moral, moral bay, who know how to do the Fulani hair, you know, the, uh, the, you look up the Fulani hairstyle, some of you will wear them today, they call Fulani braids. But there's a class of women who know, and this is what they do. And what's interesting, my sisters, like, you know, we descend from Fulani and, and my mother was a hairstylist. My sister to this day was is a hairstylist. And my, even my, my older sister, my Jaja is a hairstylist, my Minyan, my, my younger sister, she's a hairstylist. So obviously the women in my family, they come from that, that class because it's just, it runs in the family. And the men, we're usually, and women, we're usually teachers. So we come from that class. But then there's a class that are um, also fishermen, and this is the class that helped the Fulani across the water when they want to herd their cattle, and the, the, the tide season come in, and the rain season, I mean, and, you know, they have to get their cow across, cows across the water. There's a class that just they just know fishermen, they know the water, and that's another class of Fulani society. Now, Europeans have... Uh, you know, um, how could I say, changed the narrative and said, like, you know, Fulani had all these slaves. And I want to talk about that at another time, slavery and Fulani, because there's a lot of stuff on the Internet that is really like um, not only half true, but some, some of it is just outright lies. Uh, but this was they, they called it a Fulani caste system, but it wasn't a caste system, but it was a class system. It was a system of breeding certain types of professional class. So coming back to the South, we had that type of tradition that was take was that came from Africa and was practiced among our people in the South. Not only that, the same way Fulbe people or Fulani people breed certain type of cattle. I, I said this before, I'm gonna say it again. The cows in America are African American. They're African-American just like the African-Americans. The chickens in America are African-American. <laughs> and, and several uh, uh, products. For instance, the, 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 because these cows are not native to America. They came from Africa. So did the chicken. Uh, even, in, even in the West Indies, they call it, uh, in, in uh, you know, the Spanish, they call it the guinea pollo. The guinea pollo, which means the guinea chicken, which comes from guinea which is a Fulani raised chicken. A Fulani raised chicken. They even have Guinea grass that they got from the Futajalan area and they grow it here to feed the cattle. 
because it's a rich grass, it's a tall grass. I seen it when I went out there in Long Island. You know, in many farms out in New York State and other places, they have that tall Guinea grass. But going back to this, this Fulani society and how that practice was brought over here, this produced, this kept a strong Fulani gene pool in America, so strong that I looked at the DNA of a sister named Mariam Barry from Guinea. She's a Fulani. But guess what her first population was inside of, I believe, Doclad or Harappa world, which I'm going to get to these calculators, those of you familiar with Jetmatch. Her first population was African American. So not only do when, when Fulani from Guinea, they come here, they, you know, a lot of African Americans think they're African American or they'll think they're Jamaican. And some Fulani come up as Jamaican or Afro-Caribbean as their first population because the gene pool is similar and sometimes the same. That's because in the South and in Jamaica too, they had this selective breeding and endogamous practice. So even though they took away our knowledge, we did it culturally and we did it naturally. So I want to talk about a few things, um, uh, you know, regarding how there is a white population or Muslim sons in America that descend from black people, descend from the black Muslims who were brought here. So this same type of technique of selective breeding. I want to clarify something. In my presentation on the Fulani origins of the red bone, I wanted to first dispel the myth that we got this complexion through some controlled experiment of mixing the, the black with the Indian and with the white. That's not how we, we, we came here. The red bone was, uh, were originally Fulani. However, However, these red bone did mix, some of them mix with Indian, Native American, and some of them did mix with white. This is true. And in the book that I was referring to, and some of you are aware of this practice in the South, it's called passing. Passing. Some of our people to escape slavery, they married white and had their children marry white until they became white. So when I did my DNA, I noticed I had a whole bunch of white cousins. And they were fourth cousins, a whole bunch of them. And I was thinking like, okay, where did all these white cousins come from? It was very weird. Even somebody at my job I've been working with for 16 years found out she was a cousin. She was white. So I looked at these group of cousins and I noticed as in my Georgia branch, uh, and let me make another clarification. I was talking about in my Fulani origins of the red bone that on my South Carolina branch, there was no evidence that we had any Native American DNA, but it was plenty of evidence that we were Fulani and that evidence still stands true. But that's my South Carolina branch. And, but on my Georgia branch, there was evidence. There was 1% Native American there. Now, you may say that 1% doesn't mean nothing. As the saying goes, where there's smoke, there's fire. So I found these so-called white cousins. Some of them had 20% Native American. Some of them had 30% Native American. But if you look at them, they look white. Some of them had 7% African. Some of them had as high as 30% African, but if you look at their face, they look like they're 100% white. And what I also noticed is that these white cousins had North African DNA and they had Middle Eastern DNA, which for some reason it didn't show up on my ancestry. I don't know why, but I have an idea. So... Here, 
you have a whole group of whites that look white who came from this selective breeding and they passed. And a lot of them moved away from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and they moved out to other places so people won't know who they were. But yet some of them kept our surnames. Here's another confirmation. Um, when I spoke about my family from Sumter, South Carolina, Redbone, Privateer, that branch of my family, there were four uh, names of the Red Bones of Privateer. One were the Smilings, one were the Clives, one were the Goings, one were the Gibbs. Now the Gibbs, I seen them. I, I met a man named Edward Gibbs. I saw pictures of his family, looked just like my family. And I know these Red Bones are Fulani people. They were the Gibbs and the Goins. Now the Gibbs and the Goins, through ancestry, I learned that, yes, my South Carolina branch is indeed uh, related to the Gibbs and the Goings, who are the red bone of Privateer, Sumter, South Carolina. We're not related to the Clives. We're not related to the Smilings. The Smilings were called Indians, the Smiling Indians, and the Clives. We're not related to them. I found no evidence of that. But the Goings and the Gibbs were definitely red bone, and they still have Fulani features up into this day, up into this day. So some of these married and begin to intermarry with white and Native American. So here it is, the original red bone were Fulani, but now the red bone today, they look and have become white. They have become white. But they know that they have they are mixed with black and native american now this is what i call from my perspective the muslim sons of north america because they descend from the west african muslims who were brought here during the time of slavery now this is not the first time that um you know a black population African population has become white. So the reason why I dealt with the African origins of the Celts is because I want to show you that this has happened all throughout history. All throughout history. So what does this have to do with Balali? Some of his descendants are white. You have uh, uh, Baileys that are black in my family and you have Baileys that are white. You have walkers, which is one of the names of, of uh, Bilali descendants that are black, and I have walkers that are white. I have Wilsons that are black. I have Wilsons that are white. I have um, Bells that are black. I have Bells that are white. Some of them stayed black and kept marrying it into to the black family, and some of them married white until they became white. But again, in their DNA, they have black. Now, there are certain tools on GEDmatch. I, I love the GEDmatch site, and um, I hate to advertise for people, but I love it because it has, one, they have Muslim geneticists on there, which is good. Um, and, you know, so they don't have this, and, and they have several calculators by which you can measure your DNA. But first, I want to talk about the ancient origins of the Celts and to show you that this type of thing was always going on. Clyde Winters who I like to cite uh, a lot, Clyde Winters, um, he did an article, he's a black geneticist, and he says the ancient Celts and Vikings were black people. The ancient Celts and Vikings were black people. So let's read what he has to say. The ancient Celts and Vikings were black people. The Celts were originally black people. In forest, he says, uh, 4,000, 4, 58 BC. Excuse me, I have to get some light here. Oh, this is not working. BC claimed that the Celts were black or Ethiopians. The Celts continued to be recognized as black by Tacitus, who wrote about the black Celts and Picts in 80 AD. The Celts on the mainland of Europe were called Iberians or Silures. Though the original Celts were black over time, their name was stolen by Europeans, 
Father Ogroni has discussed the history of the Celts. He makes it clear that the original Celts were the Iberians. The Iberians were probably conquered by the Ligurians. It is suggested that the Ligurians may be represented by the modern Basque of Spain. The Ligurians took the name Celt. The Ligurians slash Celts were conquered by the Gaulish speaking people. The Gauls conquered the Ligurians and pushed them into Spain. It was these Gauls who imposed their language on the Iberian and Ligurian Celts. The Gauls were Belgians. According to Father Ogroni, the Irish and Welsh are descendants of the Gauls. These Gauls spoke Gaulish or Gaelic. The Germans conquered the Gaulish Celts and Gaulish disappeared around 4th century. All of the black Celts in Britain were not erased by the Gauls. This is, uh, uh, okay, so now they, you know, he, he, he deals with Peyton. You could, you could uh, read the article online, but this is something I want to point to. There's also genetic evidence linking the Basque and Ninja Congo speakers. Both groups share SRY108311, which is a haplotype. Uh, and then he, he names the other haplotypes, which I'm not going to bog you down with that. So there's a linguistic and genetic evidence that support an African origin of the Celts. So, before you had these um, whites in America that descend from blacks and blacks that became white, this also happened with the Celts. And what's also interesting, you know, uh, I, I noticed the way the Celts dance. Uh, the Celtic dancers, I, I looked at them, and they, 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 they dance with their feet a lot. You know, they, they, they hold each other like this, you know, around the shoulder, and they dance with their feet. If I could pull this YouTube video up, the Fulani also dance in that same manner. Now, dance, you may, you may dismiss it like, oh, you just learned to dance. No, no, no. Dance is also, just like language, you know, just like you have an inclination to speak a certain language. In fact, I was working with a young brother today, and I was trying to get him to say my name. This is a young brother born in America, young black brother, child, young black child. And I was trying to get him to say Elijah. He couldn't say Elijah. He kept, he kept saying Eraja, Eraja, Eraja. So then I said, let me try the Arabic. I said, Ilias, Ilias. He said it perfectly. Because genetically, West Africans, you know, had these type of names. Ilias, he said it perfectly. He couldn't properly, you know, say certain phrases. I said, say Kefahalik. He said Kefahalik per perfectly. So languages that were spoken by our people before we got here came easy to them. But this English language, which is not our natural language, came difficult. This is a part of our genomic imprint. It's the same with dancers. You see some children, they dance and they automatically shake their booty. They are African dancers, you know, from African tribes where, they, you know, they shake their booty. And, and, you know, it's an African thing. Whereas my first dance, it's, you know, I, and I, I'll never forget this as Allah allows me not to forget this. I have to say that because Allah can give you Alzheimer's. You forget everything. But when I was younger, I know the first party I went to, I had a bag of cheese, cheddar cheese, one dollar's worth of cheese, that's genomic, genetic memory right there, dairy, and I went there and I was eating my cheese, I didn't dance with my hands, I was just kicking my feet up, kicking my feet up, and I remember dancing like that. So when I saw these in Bororo dancing, just like the Celts dance, they, they put their, their you know, arms together in a circle, you know, and they was holding each other like this, and the in Bororo were dancing exactly the same way, kicking their feet up, kicking their feet up. That's the dance of the nomad who holds his stick that he, you know, moves the cattle with. He holds it on his shoulder. He puts his arms around the stick and he dances with his feet. So you see the Celtic dances, they're very similar. There was a study that I stumbled upon as well. Allah, you know, always caused me to stumble upon this out of the thousands of names. They were studying the, sur the surnames of the Celts. And one of the surnames was the name Fru. 
F-R-E-W. So they, they study these surnames, um, you know, uh, and they put, put them on Jed Match to see who they match with. And I happen to match with one of these surnames. So there's a beautiful tool on Jed Match where you can see what type of heritage you share with people. So let me, you know, if you would just bear with me, I'm going to show you, if you're on GEDmatch, how to find this tool. So in this menu on GEDmatch, right here, when you go, when you open up, you're going to see a list. Now the first list is a one-to-one -one autosomal DNA comparison. You see it right there. One-to-one -one autosomal DNA comparison. So you choose that option, and then they're going to give you uh, an option where you put in two kit numbers, two kit numbers, and then you put you know your kit number and you put the number of the of the kit that you want to compare it with, and then when you once you do that, it's going to show you which chromosome or chromosomes that you're related on. So here is. Me and Mr. Fru, we are related on chromosome 2. Me and Fru on chromosome 2. So you see right there, they tell you, and not only do they tell you that you're related on chromosome 2, they tell you how many centimorgas you share, and they show you a number where you are related between on that chromosome. So it's not that you're related on the whole chromosome, you're related at a certain portion of the chromosome, which for us is 129, 129 million, but you, you round it off on the, the meter to 129 between 134. 129 and 134. So once you get the position of where you're related, then you use another tool. You know, and if you not following, just go back and rewind this tape and you can follow. So you go back, you, you, you know, you go back to the menu and you go to this tool here. The tool is called Admixture Heritage. Admixture Heritage. It is right there. You see? Admixture Heritage. You choose that tool. So what's going to happen once you choose that tool? A menu is going to open up admixture utilities and it's going to have certain projects you choose one there's the mdlp project which is like an ancient project there's euro genes that specifies in european then there's doe clad harappa world and others i prefer the doe clad calculator and once you open the doe clad calculator you put in you choose this option right here there's an option that says paint the difference between two kits. Paint the difference between two kits. Now, once you choose that option, you put the two kits in, you put the chromosome number. Let me see, did I take a screenshot of that? You choose the chromosome number. They're going to tell you where to put the kits, and you choose the chromosome number that you're related on. And remember, your positions. Okay, so for me and Mr. Fru, who is a d direct descendant of the Celts, it was 129 to 134. So now, you're going to see a color code. Now, these colors here, West European, East European, Mediterranean, etc. So for this, I use the Africa 9, which gives you this, Europe, Northwest Africa, Southwest Asia, which is like the Arabian Peninsula, East Africa, South Africa, Mbuti, West Africa, Biaka, San. So all of these colors represent a certain, uh, you know, code. So once you do that, once you choose the color code, then you look where you're related. So for me, it's, you know, again, 129 to 130. So if you look, his 
chromosome was mostly red, mostly Western, I mean, mostly European, until they got to the area where we were related. The area that we shared, look how colorful it becomes. It was all red until it got to our area. This is from 129 to 140, uh, 134, excuse me. And you see green, you see yellow, you see brown, you see orange, and you see a little bit of red. Green, yellow, brown, orange, red. Now, let's go back and see what that represents. The red is Europe. The orange is Northwest Africa. The brown is Southwest Asia, which is the Arabian Peninsula. And the yellow is East Africa. And the green is West Africa. That admixture is exactly, exactly Fulani admixture. That admixture is exactly Fulani admixture. Arabian Peninsula, North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and Fulani even have a small percentage of what is called, what is called European genes. But there are no such thing as European genes. There's even an article entitled The Nonsense of European Genes. There's no such thing as European genes because all genes come out of Africa. So there you have this heritage, which you would think, oh, he's related to a Celt. He must be white. No. It's not that they are in us. It's that we are in them. And we really have to change this narrative. We really have to start speaking like this. We have to start, stop saying that we are a percentage of European. We have to say the Europeans are a percentage of us. The Europeans are a percentage of us. I'm going to give you another example. So here's my two population in Africa 9, my secondary population, right? And on here, you see Morocco Jews, Morocco Jews. I got that. Man, I mean, over half my secondary population was either... Uh, you know, Morocco Jews or North African Jews. North African Jews, Morocco Jews, Morocco Jews, and the others are Tuscan and North Italian. So out of 20 populations, 10 were Jews, Moroccan Jews, or North African Jews. And by the way, Africa 9 is the calculator where all people, you know, uh, white or black, where they want to find their Jewish heritage, they go to the Africa 9 calculator. You can look that up and they, you know, they see their, their heritage. But I'm not Jewish. I'm Hebrew. I descend from Abraham, but I'm not Jewish. <laughs> but they, they, the calculator tells you how you related to those Hebrew populations. So over half my populations is Hebrew. The other is three are North African. And the other seven are Tuscan, and you may say, well, Tuscan, that's white, isn't it? We're going to talk about that. Tuscan, and the other is North Italian. So, let's talk about these Tuscan people for a second. And just bear with me. So here, here's Tuscani, right here, in what is called Central Italy. Down this way, Sicily, of course, is next to Africa. Um, and you go up in the central is, is, uh, Tuscan. The islands that are right across from Africa, you could go from there straight into central Italy. So what is it about these Tuscan people that some of us, a lot of us in black America, when we do this Africa 9 to population, we come up as Tuscan. It is not because, again, the European is in us. It's because we are in the European. So 
If I could, if you could bear with me, I could find this article. Uh, I hope I didn't lose it. Give me a second. Aha! Mitochondrial DNA Variation of Modern Tuscans is the name of the article. It's on American Journal of Human Genetics. And I'll try to read through it briefly. The origin of the Etruscan people has been a source of major controversy for the past 2,500 years. Think about this. It's been controversy. What is the controversy about these people for the past 2,500 years? There's controversy. And several hypotheses have been proposed to explain their language, listen closely, their language and sophisticated culture. Their language and sophisticated culture. So these Etruscan people were, you know, uh, you know, this has been controversial because they were highly sophisticated and, uh, you know, their language and their sophisticated culture, including uh, they, they thought they were of Asian Anatolian origin. To address this issue, we analyzed the mitochondrial DNA, the maternal DNA of 322 subjects from three well-defined areas of Tuscany and compared their sequence variation with that of 55 Western Eurasian populations. But check out what comes out of this study. Most of the Tuscans, uh, it's going to take me a while to find this, but let me just say, if you go to the study, you're going to see that these Tuscans, the majority of them have North African maternal DNA, such as U5 and haplogroup L. Most of them are haplogroup U5, haplogroup L. This is my maternal DNA, and this is why North Italian and Tuscan comes up. Tuscan, uh, they say in this article, influence the civilization in northern Italy. But before that, they were a separate civilization. They migrated, of course, right there to northern Italy, and they influenced that civilization. So these people with these high civilization were of African origin, and they have African maternal DNA. So, again, they are not in us. We are in them. And even, let's say, even if you did have a, a white grandmother or a white great-great-grandmother and she gave you U5B1B, she's just giving you back the haplogroup that we gave to them. So it just came back full circle, like the Quran says, you know, you, you return to us. And they basically return, returning the haplogroup that we gave to them. So even if you had a white parent or a white grandparent or a white great grandparent, if they gave you haplogroup L or haplogroup U5, they basically made you more African. They didn't make you extra European. They made you more African because these are African haplogroups, African maternal DNA. So, uh, you know, yes. So some of you, y'all see, oh, I'm, I'm part I'm 10% North Italian. No, you're 100% black. It's just that the North Italians are related to you. That's what you should be happy about. So, and, and finally, I just want to end. It's almost time for my grip over here, and I have to get ready to pray because I got to pray because I wouldn't be able to stumble upon any of this information if Allah did not guide me. And, and please, let me, let me just say, you know, the Almighty Elijah Muhammad said the key to finding yourself is through prayer. You know, if you don't pray, Allah, God, don't care for you. The creator of that reserve don't care for you. If you're not calling on him, he'll leave you lost and blind. You won't be able to find yourself. Find who, who you are. The Almighty Allah said the key to finding yourself is through prayer. And, and I want to encourage you, those of you who are watching television five, seven, eight hours a day, there are a whole series of TV shows I have never seen. And you wonder why I'm able to speak four, four languages, five languages. Because I, 
I, I put languages in my head instead of foolish television shows. Stop deceiving yourself saying, I just want to know what's going on in the world. So I watch Empire. I watch all these shows. I haven't seen one episode of Empire. I don't know what's going on with that. You're not going to know what's going on in the world by watching TV. You're just going to let them shape your perception of the world through watching that box. That idiot box. It is an idiot box. It dumbs you down. It makes you concerned and get your emotions worked up over a bunch of fictional characters. Trust me, the reality of yourself, the reality of the people is far more exciting and adventurous than any television show. So um, I'm going to stop right there. There's more I want to say on this on this issue, but uh, I'm going to end it right there. I hope that what I said was comprehensive. I hope you were able to follow it. If you have any questions, you're welcome to inbox me. Um, you know, or you could post it down before I get off. But, you know, inshallah, we'll continue maybe later on tonight um, because I think there's some things that, that I didn't cover. But thank you for listening and may Allah continue to bless you. Assalamu alaikum.